You're, you're trying to take an enemy. Honor God in that relationship. And take an enemy and turn them into a friend. More than that, you're trying to lead an enemy to become a brother or sister in Christ. This morning, we are in Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. That is Romans 12, verses 14 through 21. Romans 12 begins as a very decisive breaking point in the book of Romans, the first 11 chapters being doctrinal in nature. That is, you are being taught truths about God's redemptive plan and purposes throughout all of history, culminating in the sending of His Son, Jesus Christ, to live a sinless life and to die a vicarious, atoning death as the substitute for our sins. And then, ultimately, Jesus being raised up from the dead and seen at the right hand of God where we will be judged one day. Those whose faith is in Jesus, their sins being paid for on Calvary. And those who spurn the Lord, those who are not faithfully trusting in Jesus, they will endure an eternity apart from God in a place called hell. So in response to these truths and into the to magnificent truths of God showing mercy to very, very undeserving people, what does Paul say there at the beginning of chapter 12? He says in verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers... Brothers and sisters, that is, people whose faith is in Jesus, I appeal to you, I urge you, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So Paul essentially says this, because you as the people of God, undeserving people, have received mercy, that is, God has withheld wrath from you, he's shown you grace, because you've received the mercies of God, then you must offer yourselves to God as a living sacrifice. You remember we made the careful distinction a few weeks ago that a living sacrifice is very unique. A sacrifice is a one-time offering because when you make the sacrifice, that animal dies. That's what you see in the Old Covenant. But a living sacrifice is different. A living sacrifice is not a one-time sacrifice. It's an all-the-time giving of your life in surrender and in obedience to God and His commands. That is our spiritual worship. That's what Paul says. That's how we worship God truly. You want to know what God wants from you? God doesn't just want beautiful songs. He doesn't even just want beautiful songs that are filled with truth. He wants lives that are lived out based on that truth. And then guess what? God's people gather together and they celebrate him in spirit and in truth. God wants our lives. Because you've received mercies from God, you must live your life for God. That's the point that Paul's making in Romans chapter 12. And he's applied it in a number of different ways. He's applied it first in the the first section following Romans 12, 1 through 2, verses 3 through 8. He applied these truths, what it means to be a living sacrifice in the church, in the Lord's household, using the gifts that God has given you, the spiritual gifting God has given you to build up the church, knowing your place, knowing your position, and then functioning there. That is, swimming in your lane. Be where God wants you to be, doing the things that God wants you to be. Don't don't be a, a, a limb of the body that is struggling with paralysis. No, if God's given you a gift, use that gift. Don't be a limb that is not benefiting the body. Don't be a cancer that is only receiving from the body but is only doling back malignancy. No, be a valuable member of the body of Christ. Use your spiritual gifting. And then in verses 9 through 13, Paul tells you these certain characteristics that ought to be present in the Christian's life. I summarize those in four main characteristics. That is deep love. Our lives ought to be characterized by a deep love, a familial kind of love. People who have been raised in different homes, people who have grown up and lived different lives, bought by the blood of Jesus, sitting around the Lord's table, treating one another just like 
family. That is the kind of deep love that ought to characterize your life as one who has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Not only that, but your life ought to have some fiery passion. Ought to have some fiery passion. You ought to be excited about the Lord. You ought to serve the Lord with zeal and with passion. In whatever way the Lord has gifted you to serve, do it with all your heart. Don't leave anything. Don't leave anything in the gas tank at the end of this life. Your life ought to be characterized by deep love, by fiery passion. It also ought to be characterized by relentless determination. You are determined to walk in faith every step of this life until Jesus calls you home or until he returns. You walk faithfully with him. You you persevere through suffering and through hardship. That's the kind of ability that God gives you by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit and also by his permanent indwelling presence. So a deep love, a fiery passion, a relentless determination, and then finally but not least, Paul explains to us that our lives as Christians ought to be characterized by generous care. Generous care. And he really gives you two ways of applying that truth. Generously caring for those who are in your midst. Seeing needs and meeting those needs. If you have the ability to meet a need, you ought to meet that need. In fact, the Apostle John tells us in one of his shorter epistles that if we have the ability to meet a need, we see a brother in need and we don't meet that, that we are worse than an unbeliever. But we ought to show deep care, generous care to those among us. And then we also ought to be hospitable to those who are just passing through. So so God expects the the character of generosity to be present within us, not just to those who are always among us, but to those who are here for a short period of time, and then they move on. We ought to be a generous people, a fiery people, a relentless people, a loving people. So we know who we should be. Those are all good things. Those are wonderful things. I left last Sunday. Man, I was, I was fired up after preaching that past saying, God, this is who you want me to be. This is who I want to be. I, I want to strive to do these things. And then you get to verses 14 through 21. And those verses are not so fun to deal with. Oh, friends, they're easy to understand cognitively. They're difficult to implement practically. Because we're talking about difficult situations. Anybody in here been through a difficult situation? Difficult not because you don't know the answer, but because you're dealing with sinners just like you and sinners just like me. See, we always complicate things. We always seemingly muddy the waters, and everybody brings their emotions into events and into arguments, and we have bickering, and we have fighting, and we have backstabbing, and we have ugliness, and everybody smiles. But we know, we know. We know that there are, there are very likely people in here who haven't spoken to one another in years. We know it is very likely that there are husbands and wives in here who smile when they're with each other around other people, but when they're not in the presence of other people and needing to put a show on, they are at each other's necks. Brothers and sisters, it ought not be so. Let's be real for a moment, and let's just deal with some difficult situations. What I want to talk to you about this morning is how Christians respond to difficulty. How Christians respond to difficulty. In verses 14 through 21, what Paul does is he describes for you and gives you the proper response to four difficult scenarios. That is, he gives you four situational scenarios. Responses. He speaks very generally. He speaks very generally because you will find yourself at some point or another in one of these situations. Or maybe you find yourself in all four situations at one time and you're in a real predicament. 
So how do you navigate these waters? Good thing is, God hasn't left us in the dark. He's told us exactly what we ought to do. You know, our problem a lot of times is not knowing what we ought to do. It's having the willingness to do the right thing. That's the problem that we have. He so, said, Lord, give me understanding, give me understanding. And he says, read my word, it's already in there. Lord, speak to me, Lord, speak to me. And he says, I have spoken, it's already here. Oh, the problem is not God's silence, the problem is our disobedience. So we go to God's word, and we see how we are to respond as Christians in difficult situations. We'll look at this passage really in four sections the fifth, the fifth part is really a, a general summarizing statement for everything that we do. Look at verse 21 with me, and you'll see that summarizing statement. He says, do not be overcome with evil. That's an imperative, a command. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. In what situation, Paul? Well, that's a general statement. He's talking about every situation. Never think that you are going to overcome evil by being a little more devious. Do not be overcome with evil. Overcome evil with good. And he's going to give you four responses that you ought to make in particularly difficult situations. Four responses that will honor God every time. Four responses that will honor God every time. I'm going to summarize the entirety of this passage, keeping in mind, keeping in mind that Paul is, is applying in a more specific manner what it means to be a living sacrifice. So let's summarize the entirety of the sermon in this very short sentence. In every situation, I must overcome evil with good. In every situation, I must overcome evil with good. Let's look at these four very difficult situations. Let me kind of just announce those situations to you first, and then we'll dive right in. In verse 14, you're going to see how to respond when you're hated. How to respond when you are hated. You'll notice something that in the, this passage here, Paul does not deny the reality that there are going to be people who hate you. Paul does not deny the reality that there are going to be people who hurt you. Paul does not deny the reality that it can be hard to live in the middle of the people of God. He doesn't deny that. In verse 15, he tells you how to respond in the highs and in the lows. How to respond in the highs and in the lows. You'll see why that's a problem. That's actually a big problem. Verse 16, you'll see how to live in harmony in the household of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. How to live in harmony in the household of God. Verse 17 through 20, how to respond when someone harms you. For in every situation, I must overcome evil with good. So let's look here at verse 14, how to respond when you are hated. Look at it. It says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. In just these few short passages, you'll feel as though the Apostle Paul is shooting you with a grammatical machine gun. It's essentially what he does. He just fires off these, these expectations and exhor exhortations and commands. It's just sentence after sentence, response after response, and he's just rapid fire shooting them at you. Now, Paul does this in many of his epistles and many of his letters. He will give you a string of exhortations. And if you can understand in that string of exhortations, if there is any connective tissue then you can be under, begin to understand exactly what those exhortations mean. I'll just tell you, every one of these verses is about a difficult situation. Even the verse about rejoicing with those who rejoice, weeping with those who weep. All of this is about overcoming evil with good. So the first thing that you encounter is when somebody hates you. What does he say? He says, bless, that is a command. Bless those who persecute you. Bless those who persecute you. You know what the word persecute actually means, just the literal rendering of it? It means those who chase you. 
They just chase you. They run around. They're not just sitting around passively saying, if you offend me, I'm going to come after you. They're just actively pursuing you. Have you ever had somebody do that? Just watching you, waiting to pick you apart, waiting to attack you, waiting to tear you down. Maybe you encounter someone like that at work. Heaven forbid you ever encounter anyone like that in the church. But let's just be real. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus didn't die for perfect people. We understand reality. He says, bless, eulogize those who are pursuing you hotly with the intent to be malicious. Eulogize them. You know what a eulogy is? Been to many funerals in my time in the pastorate. A eulogy is when somebody says something kind about the one who has passed on. A lot of times it's a family member, it's a close friend, and they'll get up and they'll say, you know, hey, you remember when. You remember way back when, and, and brother or sister so-and-so, they really showed their character. They were kind to me in that moment. They eulogize, they say something kind. What is Paul saying here? He says, bless those who persecute you, who chase you. Maybe they're hunting you down for religious reasons, and maybe they're just mean. Maybe they're just ugly people. Paul doesn't apply it specifically. He intends it to be implied, applied very generally. He says, eulogize the people chasing you to harm you. In other words, say something kind. Say something kind about people who hunt you down. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless. Two times over in the same sentence, he gives a command. Bless and do not curse them. See, cursing is the opposite of blessing. Blessing is when we say something good about somebody, either to them or to somebody else. Cursing is when we say something bad about somebody to that person or to somebody else. See, we think that cursing seems to be just this short list of bad words. Don't say those bad words, friends. But you don't have to say that short list of bad words to curse somebody. All you have to do is just talk poorly about them. Talk poorly about them to their face, but many times we're not that bold. Many times we don't curse people to their face. We do it behind their back. We do it when they're, they're not watching, when they're not listening, when they're not present. But you know what normally happens with those curses? They're said in private, but they become known publicly. You, can, you wouldn't believe what so-and-so just said. <laughs> Bless those who chase you. Bless and do not curse. In other words, use your words to do good, not harm. That's the first response, the first situational response. Write that down with me. When you are hated, use your words to help, not harm. And we ought to write these down. We ought to write them down where they're easily accessible. Almost even stick a little note card in your wallet. When something happens, you pull it out and just go through these four situational responses. When you are hated, use your words to help and not harm. Listen to what Jesus said, because Paul essentially quotes Jesus here. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 28. This is part of Jesus' sermon on the mount. Jesus says this in Luke 6, 27. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. You see, the blessing of somebody is not just saying something good to them or about them to another person. It's also saying something good about that person to God. Have you ever tried to pray for an enemy? And I mean, not, not, not an imprecatory prayer. Don't say, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, cut them off at the knees. No. Bless them. On their behalf, in the presence of God, as a, as a, a priest filled with the Spirit of God, praying for someone, 
Say, God, I know that they harmed me. I know they hate me. I know they pursue me. But Lord, would you bless them? Lord, would you show them grace? Lord, repentance is grace. Lord, show them grace. Give them blessing. Give me opportunity to be kind to them. It's hard to hate somebody when you're praying positively for them. It's hard to hate somebody when you pray positively for them. But a lot of times we want to characterize our prayers to God like this. And I'm telling you, I'm just like you, okay? A lot of times we, we like to pray like this. God, you know how evil they are. You know what they said, God. You know what they did. And Lord, I'm just putting it in your hands. That's not blessing them. Now, he's going to tell you in 17 through 20, leave room for the wrath of God. God will handle it. But as far as you are concerned, pray for that person. Quit talking about them to somebody else and talk about them to God in a positive way. You can't say nothing nice. Say nothing at all. Mama was right, wasn't she? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Listen to Jesus. Luke 6, same passage, verse 35 and 36. He says, but love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them. Lend to them. Lend to who? Lend to your enemies. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. He's like, oh, I'm not going to help that person out because I know they're not going to help me out. Jesus says that's exactly when you ought to help them out. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then, he says, your reward will be great. They may not pay you back, believe me, friend. On the authority of God's word, God will pay you back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Who does that include? That includes us. He has been kind. He says, brothers and sisters, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. You receive the mercies of God because you're ungrateful and you're wicked. And God withheld his wrath from you and showed you kindness and showed you grace. And Jesus says, when you show that same kind of kindness to people who are ungrateful and hateful and ugly, guess who you're like? You're not like a doormat, friend. You're like Jesus. You're like God. He says, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Startling. When you think about a man in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7, the first man recorded in Scripture as a Christian martyr, someone who was killed for their faith, a man by the name of Stephen Stephen had just preached one of the greatest sermons ever recorded. A tremendous history of God's work of redemption through the people of Israel. And they became so angry, the Jews did, they became so angry with one of their own, with Stephen, that they reached down and they picked up rocks. They picked up rocks to pummel him. Acts chapter 7, verse 59 through 60. It says... While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell down on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That's not easy. That's not easy. Bless and do not curse, even if it means that the last word you get is a kind word. Speak the kind word. Even if it means you lose the fight, even if it means you lose the argument, even if it means you walk away humbled, bless and do not curse. If you're going to get the last word, 
You better make it a kind word. Think about Jesus. As Jesus hung there on the cross, it's hard for me to even talk about it now. I, I remember, I remember there, as, as we were in the garden tomb area a number of weeks ago in Israel, and from the garden tomb, you, you can look up and you see on that, that side of the mountain. You remember that, Brother Carlton? You see on the side of the mountain, you see the, the hill of the skull. It looks just like a skull. It's the place where Jesus was crucified. And as Jesus hung on that cross, his disciples being scattered, he's being surrounded by Romans who are tormenting him and putting him to death. And he's surrounded by Jews who are cursing him. If you're really the son of God, call down angels so that they can rescue you. If you're a physician, heal yourself. You remember what Jesus prays? Father, forgive them so they know not what they do. Paul says, because you receive the mercies of God, say something kind about other people. Say something kind about people who hate you. Do they deserve it? No. We know what they deserve. Guess what? God can handle that. When you are hated, use your words to help, not harm. Listen how the Apostle Peter summarizes this point. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. Peter says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. What, what does that mean? That means he didn't deserve for people to hate him. There are sometimes when people hate us, and we deserve it. Jesus didn't deserve it. And it says in verse 23, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Jesus chose to bless and not curse. He chose to do as Paul is going to instruct in a minute. He chose to leave room for God to work. When you're hated, use your words to help, not harm. So that's the first situational response you need to just bear down on and engrave in your heart. When I want to say something bad about somebody because I think it'll get me ahead in the argument, it'll make them look bad, it'll make me look good, just stop right there. You're wrong. Even if you're right, you are wrong in the way you're going about it. Bless and do not curse. Now listen to what he says in verse 15. This is how you respond to others in the highs and in the lows. In this context, let me ask you, every other verse surrounding verse 15 is about how you interact with enemies, how you interact with people who are hostile. So verse 15, I take it to mean, is supposed to be seen in the light of a hostile person because you'll see this command is actually very easy to follow if it's not about someone who is hostile. This one it says, verse 15. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Man, that's, that's actually, if you're happy with somebody, if you're in a good relationship with somebody, that's not only easy, that's natural. It, you know what, if my brother called me and he said, you know what, somebody just gave me $20,000, you know what I'd do? I'd say, share the happiness, brother, <laughs> right? I want to rejoice with you, right? I want to rejoice. Now, I'd be happy for him. Right? I couldn't help but smile because, man, God was just so gracious to him. They got to rejoice with him. And my same brother, well, I got one, if he calls me and he says something bad's happened, it's going to immediately stir my heart. I'm going to leave what I'm doing, I'm going to go and be with him, and I'm going to weep with him. That's easy. That's, that's easy and it's natural. I don't think that's what Paul is talking about at all. The context of verse 14 through 21 is dealing with enemies. So now look at it in that light. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Think about that person that you just can't stand. 
say, well, they don't exist. I, I, I can deal with everybody. Right? Let's be honest. Think about that person who has harmed you, who has hated you, and guess what? They just back into $20,000. Hey, look what I found. Isn't this great? Boy, this is good. I really deserve this. Look what I found. What does Paul say to do? Rejoice with those who rejoice. You see, when you're dealing with an enemy, it's natural to the natural man to do the opposite. When an enemy rejoices, you weep. This is not right. This is not fair. God, I'm sure you know. Do you know what they've done? Do you know what they've said? Weep with those who weep. Think about when something bad happens to somebody who has harmed you. What do we say? Boy, they got their comeuppance. They got what was coming to them. You should treat people better. You just should, right? That's how we say it, too. You just should treat people better. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. That's not Christianity. That's karma. That's paganism. That's what that is. Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. A second situational response, write this down. This will be very helpful. When someone goes through something, respond empathetically. Empathetically. I chose that word carefully. It's not sympathetically. Sympathetically means you're feeling pity towards someone. Empathy is when you have understanding. It's when you have understanding of what somebody is going through, and then you, you share in that with them. You have empathy. That's hard to do. It is hard to be empathetic to somebody who hates you. It's hard to be empathetic to somebody you can't stand. Well, you're already on good grounds because you've blessed them. You haven't cursed them. You, you prayed for God to bless them. And guess what? God blessed them. So what do you do? I'm not going to be mad about God answering that prayer. I'm going to be happy about it. God, thank you for blessing this person who views me as an enemy. Well, thank you for doing that. You've been kind and gracious. Lord, you've been gracious to me. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. When someone goes through something, respond empathetically. In other words, treat people like you would treat your own family. How, how, does, family, how does family go through times of joy? How does family go through times of sorrow? How, how does family go through the highs and through the lows? One word, together. Together. Someone goes through something, respond empathetically. Use your words to help, not harm. Now look at verse 16. Verse 16, you see how to live in harmony in the household of God. It's not always easy to live in harmony in the household of God, is it? Got one person willing to tell the truth. It's not always easy to live in harmony in the household of God, is it? Got three people that believe the truth. I'm going to keep doing this because it's, it's, it's working. Okay? It's not always easy to live in harmony amongst the household of God. That's right. Let's be honest. You can't fix a problem if you don't acknowledge it. Let's quit walking around like we live in some alternate universe. Okay? Let's be real about it. It's not always easy. Just admit it. It's not. So what do we do about that? How, do, how does a Christian respond in that difficult situation. Paul's going to tell us exactly what God expects of us. Just write down this truth here, this situational response first. When dealing with others, don't be self-important. Concern yourself with those in need. When dealing with others, who's the others? Not talking about the strange people on the Lost show. Who are the others? Anybody else? So when you're dealing with anybody else, 
And specifically, he's talking about the household of God. When dealing with others, don't be self-important. In other words, don't make it all about you. It's not all about me or Eric or Seth or you. It's not all about any one person other than Jesus. So when we're dealing with other people, let's quit being so self-important. We all need to swim in our swim lanes and recognize that we're doing this for the glory of God. It's about him. So don't be self-important. No, 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 no. Instead, occupy yourself. Concern yourself with those in need. It's not about me getting my way. It's about Jesus getting his way. And it's about taking care of those who can't take care of themselves. That's my responsibility. Glorify God and help the helpless. Listen to what Paul says in verse 16. He says, live in harmony. Literally, have the same concern. Have the same mind about you. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. That means do not be high-minded. Don't have your mind just stuck on the things that benefit you and are all about you. Don't be high-minded. Don't be arrogant. Don't be conceited. You know, conceit manifests itself at least in two ways. Conceit is when you think too much about yourself or when you think of yourself too much. When you think too much of yourself, you, you, you're high and lifted up. In Isaiah 6, there's only one who is high and lifted up. And his robe fills the temple. That's God. Haughtiness manifests itself when we think too much of ourselves. It also manifests itself when we think about ourselves too much. It's always about me. It's always about I. It's always about my. It's not. It's about Jesus. He says, do not be haughty. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be hard, haughty, high-minded, but associate with the lowly. Concern yourself with the poor. Concern yourself with the humble, with those who do not have. Help them out. Go ahead and back up and obey the, the previous verses. Be generous in your care for one another. Concern yourself with that. Never be wise in your own sight. You know the proverb, pride comes before fall. Pride comes before fall. When you're prideful, you think too much of yourself and you think of yourself too much. What's the solution? How do we live in harmony with one another? Let's just go ahead and extend this because it's a generalized statement. So let's just drive some tax into some particular situations. Ha how do we live in harmony together in the home? Is it some complicated answer? It's, it's not complicated. It's actually very, very simple. The issue is not in understanding. The issue is in implementation. We need to quit thinking so much about ourselves. And we need to do what we have to do to serve our Lord and to serve our family and to live in harmony. Just do it. Figure out a way. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty. Don't be high-minded. Concern yourself with the needs. What are the needs? Oh, is there trash over there? Well, it's not my day to clean up that trash Concern yourself with the need. Go clean it up. And if everybody in the home has that mentality, if everybody in the, the church body has that mentality, guess what? Every need will be met. It says in Acts chapter 4 that the believers had everything in common and there was not one person in need. Not one person in need. That same truth will work in your home. That same truth will work in the local church in this day and age. Let's quit thinking about how my needs are being met or not met. What I ought to be asking is, how am I meeting other people's needs? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Man, that sounds novel. That's great. Where did that come from? The Bible. It comes from the Bible. 
when dealing with others, don't be self-important. Concern yourselves with those in need. I love this verse. Psalm 133, verse 1. We ought to all memorize this. Psalm 133, verse 1. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. When dealing with others, don't be self-important. Concern yourself with those in need. Look at verse 17 through 20. This one actually goes pretty quick. It's all zeroing in on the same idea. Four things that you need to be, that you need to do, four things that characterize you when someone hurts you, when someone harms you, that is. Write down this fourth situational response. When someone harms you, respond righteously, peaceably, faithfully, and kindly. It did not say respond in kind. You don't fight fire with fire. That's principles of devilry. That's not biblical principles. When someone harms you, respond righteously, peaceably, faithfully, and kindly. Look at it quickly. Verse 17, this is how you respond righteously. He says, repay no one evil for evil, but instead give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Repay no one evil for evil. Never respond in kind when someone harms you. Is it ever okay to harm someone when they harm you? We're not talking about self-defense. Jesus actually says something about self-defense. We'll read that in a little bit. It is never okay to harm someone when they harm you. It's not. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Give thought, huh? Give thought. So he's not talking about in the moment when someone is attacking you physically and you need to defend yourself. He's not saying don't defend yourself. He's not saying that. At this point, what he's talking about is when you have the opportunity to think about it, this is what you need to think. How can I do what's right? Not how can I get even? How can I really get them and just make it stick? No, no, no. That's never acceptable. Think about what to do that is honorable in the sight of all people. That's actually an evangelistic tool. It tells people about the mercies of God. Listen to how Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. He says this in Matthew 5, 16, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When someone harms you, and you respond with goodness, you respond in righteousness, that takes all the attention off of you. It puts all the attention on a supernatural work that God did in you. Because he redeemed you and he changed you. You don't respond like people of the world. So then you respond righteously. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. But always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. So respond righteously. Think about it. Think about how to do the right thing. Don't react. Think about how to do the right thing. Now look at the second thing he tells you to do. Respond peaceably. Look at verse 18. He says, if possible, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. It's an interesting phrase, a conditional clause there, if possible. It's used another time in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, when Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember as he's sweating drops of blood? What does he pray to the Father? He says, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. If possible. So he's saying, Father, if there is 
any other way at all for these sinful people to be redeemed, do it that way. If there's anything you can do, God, anything other than me dying on the cross, do that. Now that's flipped on its head. And Paul says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. That means this. You're talking to yourself. Is there anything I can do in this situation to bring peace? You know how we normally respond? We normally say, well, if I go to this person, they're not going to receive me. If I go to this person, they're still going to be mad and they're still going to hate me. They're still going to be ugly. They're still going to pursue me. They're still going to be malignant. I just don't think that's the wise thing to do. You know what the Bible says, don't cast your pearls before swine. Right? Do we, am I, we're jiving here, right? That's not what he says, though. He says, if possible, so far as it depends on you. That means this. If there is enmity, if there is fighting, if there is ugliness, if there is hostility, it better not be because of you. Better yet, I should say this. If there is any ugliness at all, it better not be because of me. You know what? I can't control how anybody else responds. You can't control how your enemy will respond. Paul's not talking about your enemy. He's talking about you. Paul's not talking about your spouse. Paul's talking about you. Have you done everything possible to make the situation peaceable? You say, well, that's not my responsibility. They're not doing their part. It's not about them. You're going to answer it before God for yourself. If it's possible, if you've exhausted all options, then you can stand before God and say, God, I did everything possible to bring peace in the situation. That's a lot to say, isn't it? Because what, what did God do to bring peace? He gave his own son to die. Are we willing to go that far? Are we willing to die in order to bring peace? In other words, I would rather my heart stop beating than be at enmity with you. Whether you're wrong or I'm wrong, that's beside the point. Brother, will you forgive me? Brother, can we live at peace with one another? Doesn't matter how they respond. You're not responsible for that any more than you're even responsible for somebody's response to the gospel. But you are responsible for how you act in that situation. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So you respond righteously, respond peaceably. Thirdly, respond faithfully. This is interesting what Paul says here. Respond faithfully. That means just put your trust in God. Let God, let God handle it. Okay? Listen to what he says in verse 18. Or verse 19. He says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, this is Deuteronomy 32, verse 35, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. He says, beloved, never avenge yourself. Don't try to make the situation even. That's what it means to avenge. Don't try to make the situation even. That's what la or, uh, lex talionis means. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Somebody jabs your eye out, their eye gets jabbed out. You harm me, I harm you. You do this to me, it gives me the right to do the same to you. Now we're even. That's not Christian. That is not Christ-like to get even. That's not what God expects. He says, beloved, never avenge yourselves. But what does he say? He says, leave it. This is an imperative, a command. Leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written. Let me read 
Deuteronomy 32, verse 35 through 36. Listen to what Moses writes here on behalf of the Lord. He says, vengeance is mine and recompense. That means paying them back. For the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand and their doom comes swiftly. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free. Vengeance is mine, the Lord says. I will repay. Paul says, don't avenge yourself. Leave, literally, leave space for God to do that. If somebody's going to get your enemy, let God do it. Just let God handle that. Because guess what? There's a number of things that are accomplished when you just let God do it. You know that you'll never be wrong. You'll know that you never went overboard. And you will know God gives them exactly what they deserve. We think that we are the perfect arbiters of justice. That we're able to measure out exactly what a person deserves. But you know what we normally do? This is why we have a court system, which prevents us from cruel and unusual punishment. Because it is depraved nature to go too far in the vengeance. In the end, we're really not God. and We're not able to dole out justice in perfect measure. Only God is. So leave room for God to do that. God is able to punish a person accordingly, and He will do it. It's not a matter of if he will do it. It's a matter of when. He'll do it eventually. Just let God do it. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So you respond faithfully. Respond righteously. Respond peaceably. Respond faithfully. That means trust God. Trust God to make things even. Listen to this. Finally, respond kindly. He says, on the contrary, to the contrary, verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And then he quotes Proverbs chapter 21. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. He says the best thing that you can do to irritate somebody who has harmed you, be nice to them. Be nice to them. They, if, if somebody is truly intent on being malicious and harming you, they want to see you mad, they want to see you angry, they want to stir you up to a godless response, and instead you respond with kindness. And they say, what do I have to do to this person to take them down? There's nothing I can do to take this person down. Just respond kindly to them. Now, when I look at these four situations, these four kinds of responses... I use my words to help, not harm. Respond empathetically, meaning understand what somebody's going through, even an enemy, and then share that same response. Don't be self-important. Don't think about yourself. Think about other people. And then finally, respond righteously, peaceably, faithfully, kindly. See, when we're in difficult situations and we respond the way that God has called us to respond, you know what it leaves open to happen? You know what it leaves open? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. You're you're trying to take an enemy, honor God in that relationship, and take an enemy and turn them into a friend. More than that, you're trying to lead an enemy to become a brother or sister in Christ. That's what you're trying to do. Don't try to retaliate. Try to evangelize. There is a reason this person is acting out. There's a reason this person is acting godless. It may be because they're godless. And what they need is not, is not a paddle. What they need is not somebody beating them over their head. Let God do that. What they need is mercy. But for the grace of God, I would be your enemy too. But for the grace of God. So we got to leave this door open. And you think about this. 
Who, who is it that responded peaceably? Who is it that responded kindly and righteously and faithfully to people who were at enmity with him? It's God, none other than God. God had every right to kill us and send us to hell to make things even. God had every right to to shake his fist at us and say, "You, you clumps of dirt. You, you sinned against me. You violated my laws. You were ungrateful. You were wicked. I made it rain on your crops. I gave you jobs. I gave you food. I gave you shelter. And yet you curse my name. Let's just make things even. God would be perfectly just to give us hell. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't retaliate. He atoned. He didn't send us to hell. He purchased us at his own price. In every situation, I must overcome Evil with good. In that way, I will be like my Father in heaven. Not easy, friends, but it's right. It's not easy, but it's right. Let's pray.